Well, hello, sports fans. Uh, this is Larry Eater speaking to you from San Jose, California. In the middle of the screen is Stuart Weir, who is in the intellectual capital of the world, Oxford, England. It's also the uh, uh, vaccine capital of the world, the golf capital of the world, and now the pub capital of the world. Um, greetings, dear friend. How are you? Hello. I'm good, Hi. thank you. I'm actually I'm going to a pub on when, uh, on um, Wednesday. Yes, this is nice. This has been my first time to the gym this week. First time in the year. Wow. So things are opening up a bit. That's wonderful. This is Athletics Chat 48. Just to keep Michael happy. See, Michael, I actually did the right number. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, yeah, I we went out uh, drove to Santa Cruz, which is about a a 40 mile drive from here, but traffic was so backed up because everybody wanted to go to the beach. We drove through the mountains and then we went to an outdoor pizza place and it was glorious just to uh, my niece and my girlfriend and I and enjoying a pizza and a a pint. And, um, you know, you had to have your little mask, you have your mask around and stuff, but you can take it off when you eat. But I just, it's, it's, it's gotta be amazing over now, is all of England open, or how is how is it working? Um, we are opening in stages um, okay. at the moment. The various things. I mean, you can you can. When I say I'm going to a pub, that means I'm going to sit outside because you cannot sit inside yep. for another yep. another three weeks. Okay. Yeah, we were outside too. I, my my niece is not comfortable going inside to places, and I can understand that completely. Um, Probably in the California area, sitting outside is easier than in Oxford when it may just be a little bit cooler. Yes, yeah, considering you guys had snow, what, a week ago. So, yes, yeah. it, it, uh, yeah. when I was back in Wisconsin up until two weeks ago, uh, we had had a couple days uh, at 30 Celsius, so about 86 degrees, but most of the days were at about 18 to 20 so like what 54 to 63 with a little wind and that's chilly you know so i actually wear my mm -hmm. my hoodie um mm -hmm. but uh it's uh it's nice to be out here uh, i'm hoping to see a couple track meets uh they're having them out here they're limiting the i don't think they're even allowing fans but they're allowing media so i'm going to try to get mm -hmm. into one the next couple of weeks uh we're hoping to go to the Oregon relays uh, at Hayward Field, but we'll have to see if they let us right now because things are such up in the air. But great news from the UK. Um, the Diamond League is going to open up in Gateshead on May 23rd. What do you know about that kind, sir? Well, um, this is the Rabat Diamond League that yes. Rabat decided they didn't want to hold. And just suddenly it was announced that um, Britain, which had not bid for a Gateshead Diamond League, happy just to have one. Mm. Uh, of course, Gateshead is the chosen venue because Birmingham Alexander Stadium is being um, uh, renovated for the Commonwealth Games. So uh, the Diamond League is going to be in Gateshead on Sunday, the 23rd of May. We're assuming it will be the program as it was in Rabat. Mm -hmm. um, I think this has taken everyone by surprise. I mean, I inquired about media accreditation, and they said, well, hang on a moment. We're just desperately trying to put everything in place. Um, but uh, it's a great opportunity for British athletes to get um, uh, top-level competition, uh, to have a chance of getting Olympic qualifying uh, standards. And I was going to say a great opportunity for fans to see uh, top uh, athletics, but of course, in a way, we're still waiting for confirmation of that. Now, mm -hmm. we had the semi-final of the um, Football Association Cup, the big soccer competition this weekend, and they allowed 4,000 spectators just Lovely. as a test event. And so we're... They're expecting that to go up to ten to 20,000 over the next month or two. And so um, I would hope that there would be some fun. I mean, 23rd of May is just, just a month away. So I would have thought that there's a reasonable chance of, of 
uh, perhaps up to 5,000 fans, probably no more than that. Um, so, yeah, so, but it, it's great that this is happening. I mean, it, it has been a criticism of the new regime in British athletics is that they didn't seem that keen on doing events. Uh, and I think that feedback from the athletes has now been heard. And so when the um, when the Rabat Diamond League was available, it was Britain that uh, had gone in for it. So yeah, I'm really, really excited about that. I'm very much uh, hoping to go to that one again, waiting to see what the media arrangement will be. Um, but yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to try to attend um, because I think I could do Gateshead, then down to Doha, then hit, I believe, Rome, and then head home for the the trial. So that's kind of, I'm looking at uh, some plans there, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. I have my vaccination. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't go to Rome. Okay. Because the events have been moved to Florence. That's what I, I forgot. Thank you. Yes, yes, it was moved. So, yes, so uh, it'll be uh, 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 Doha to Florence then. And uh, that could be most interesting. Um, do you think, you know, we had a conversation last week. How It's funny how things change so quickly. Um, with the Gateshead meet being announced, does it give you a different view of how the financial health of British athletics, or do you believe that this is world athletics coming in, saving the day, and a couple sponsors helping out? I haven't heard any concrete information, but there was money made available from a government body for the indoor trials, mm -hmm. and then they decided that it wasn't safe to have that event. And yeah. I don't know whether that same money is available uh, for this event. Mm -hmm. um, I, from what I read in the newspapers, and I know no more than that, at this point in time, no TV deal is in place. And wow. okay. whether a TV deal can be got in a month, because TV uh, schedules are usually pretty full at a month's notice, yeah. um, and how much money would be in so, Stuart, you think, you believe that the Gates had meet uh, a positive for British athletics? Oh, very much so. I think athletes will be delighted. I think whatever fans get there will be delighted. And um, if we can find a way of getting it on um, good television, then, then that will be another positive. Define good television over there for our readers in the U.S. Is that... BBC or Sky, um, well, or how would you? If, if it's on BBC or ITV, it's the channel that everyone has access to. Cool. Um, so it's like our Sky, ABC, Sky, NBC, Sky is, CBS. Yeah, Sky is pay TV, and okay. uh, not not. I mean, just to give you an example, a big soccer match on BBC would have ten million viewers. A big soccer match in Sky would get one million viewers. Two million. Got it. Okay, that helps me understand. It's like cable over here is opposed to the big three, which are ABC, NBC, and CBS. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, the um, and then we were talking about a, a few other things. Um, so um, some very swift performances at the Tom Jones invite this weekend. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the thing that amuses me most is the. Uh, the reason they have all these events is so that the Ophelia sisters, uh, Tiffany Porter and Cindy Semper, can decide which one is the fastest. And yeah. Tiffany won this time. Wow. Um, uh, having lost the two previous ones. Sure. Um, they, they both ran 1262, which is the fastest that either of them has done for six years. But mm -hmm. then... Uh, Jasmine Camacho Quinn, whom I confess I know very little about from Puerto Rico, ran a 12.32. Totally blew my mind. That is flying. Yeah. Have you watched that video yet? No. It's, no. Oh, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It just, I don't know much about her. I've got to spend some time, and I'm going to try well, to do a piece about her. But She didn't make the world. She wasn't in the world in 19. Uh, she got to the semifinals in Rio and then was DQ'd. Wow. Um but, uh, 
Jasmine Sawyers uh, winning the long jump in 6.57. Yeah. Uh, you know, not the greatest distance, but it's early season and it's a solid performance. Um, blessing, okay, Barry, uh, an athlete I really enjoy watching and so yeah. talented, did a, uh, did a 22.66 in the, in the 200, so uh, getting back. And um, uh, Javian Oliver, 11.12 to win the 100. Now, she's somebody who has never broken 11, uh, but has done ph phenomenal things indoor. Yeah. I asked her about this, and she said, well, the reason is that so often I get injured in the outdoor season. Yeah. So if I can get through an indoor season fit, uh, she's confident that she can she can go sub eleven. So I would love to see that happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's um, it, it, again, it's just nice to see this kind of event um, happening. Yeah. No, the Tom Jones is a well respected event. There's been some big. I remember back in the '90s, Todd Williams running some screaming ten thousand meters there, and uh, mm -hmm. they've always had some great performances. And it's nice to see track and field at the high school level in the U.S. and at the college level um, or and, and at the elite level. I mean, it uh, are, um, who is it? Uh, I'm just trying to think right now. Um, th there was some great performances down in Florida this week. I know Justin Gatlin was up in uh, uh, mm -hmm. lovely at Tom Jones. That was a big hundred meters on the guy's side, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so it was nice to see, but it's good to see people rounding into shape. I'm just trying to figure out what is going on. And USATF in its lovely place has to be rather cautious. You know, um, I was filling out today media applications for our crew for the Olympic trials. And we've been told that the mix zone will be virtual. Uh, they're going to allow photographers and a few media types. And I'm hoping in my uh, advanced years uh, that we will be able to uh, do something. And um, it's um, it's very kind of an interesting um, quandary because it all gets back to what's going on in lovely Tokyo. And, uh, you know, I think maybe that's our next subject. Um, last Thursday... Um, a uh, Reuters, which is you know the Reuter Thompson News Agency, one of the best respected uh, globally, um, did a piece where they quoted the secretary of the LDP, the governing body, the governing party in um, majority party in Japan, as saying that that if the virus continues, their only option is going to be to cancel the Olympics. Now, this is a person who's tied in with the prime minister and Chinese politics or Japanese politics, excuse me, Japanese politics is like Kabuki theater. Everything is orchestrated. And um, so Reuters rightly took it as the prime minister is giving a message that don't do anything right now. And a lot of people were worried over the weekend. And then WADA came out and said, yeah, we're going to cut down on the number of uh, anti-doping folks in uh, in Tokyo because of COVID. I'm kind of going, well, you guys are down about two-thirds in testing for the last year and a half. How do we know who's clean and who's not clean? And while I like to believe that, uh, you know, the majority of athletes are clean and don't cheat, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people out there who don't. And um, yeah. so you've got that. And then you've got, on top of that, today, they said they're going to cut down the official numbers in Sapporo for the marathon and the walks. And um, the um, they're going to cut down on the, the, the numbers in the walks and the marathon. And I'm going, okay, they're already over. Dave Monty just did a piece, and we posted it from Race Results uh, Weekly. Uh, David said that, hey, a week ago, they were already over their numbers for men, 532 <laughs> qualifiers globally, and um, mm -hmm. women. And uh, then we had Elliot Kipchoge, you know, run this weekend. So, wh where do you, th how do you feel about the Olympics right now? Any deep thoughts? 
I'm just more confused by the day. I mean, yeah. I have my accreditation, and I'm supposed to pay some more money uh, at the beginning of next month, and I just don't think I'm going to be ready to make a decision at that point. Yeah, no, I just... Um, uh... I mean, it was interesting that that um, comment by the um, Prime Minister's deputy, because then there was a kind of a denial later in the day uh, where, where he said, um, of course, uh, I have complete confidence in our anti-COVID um, procedures, which um, if I were a cynical person, and you know I don't have an in, amount of cynicism, I would yeah. say he was told to say that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm no, uh, no doctor, but I think you're right. And um, mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. The Japanese culture is such that mm -hmm. I thought it was about pride, about not canceling. Mm -hmm. My Japanese friends are telling me that the IOC wants to cancel. The Japanese government says no. The LOC is caught in the middle. And the Japanese people said, we don't want 500,000 foreigners in here. We're all getting sick. What's going on? And it's a mess, you know? And, and, and it's um, we can't tell from one week to the other what's going on. Well, it's still 70% in the latest poll of yeah. Tokyo residents don't want the games uh, to be held. Uh, and then at the moment... Japan is in a kind of not quite lockdown, but you know all restaurants uh, and bars are closing at 8 p.m. Not that that would affect us if we're there, since yeah. uh, we are banned from going to any restaurants and bars during the Olympics. Other yeah, that's than, that's going to be fun. Yeah, one. yeah mm. the uh, it. The, I, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I just got a note from the USOC. When are you going to do your accommodations? And I'm like. Um, okay, am I going to even be able to go? Because we had a rumor the other day that they were going to stop non-NBC affiliated media. And I haven't been able to confirm that. Um, mm -hmm. NBC is the the uh, the TV group in the U.S. that's won the rights to, to the Olympics. And yeah. it's somewhere between, I think, a $2 and $5 billion venture for NBC. And each day the Japanese government and the LOC are coming out with pronouncements that cut mm -hmm. back the number of fans that cut back well they cut out the foreign fans and they cut out the guests mm -hmm. which you know that's mm -hmm. probably saved everybody a lot of money and then are we don't know how many Japanese fans are going to allow and I don't understand why vaccinations haven't gone better in Japan it doesn't sound like it's going well at all. Um, and I don't know if it's because of a lack of, uh, uh, of access. Um, Cause you hear over here, the U S is going to have 300 million extra in the mm -hmm. next uh, two months. So then why doesn't the U S mm -hmm. send a bunch over to Japan? I mean, I, I, I just don't. And I, and I, 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 I know I don't understand the inner workings of, of world governments, but the Olympics is a huge deal. And mm -hmm. right now we're what, a little less than three months away, a little more than three months away. And we have seen Rabat canceled and Amit moved to, um, to Gateshead. Oslo moved. Oslo moved. And here's the Oslo issue. What if Oslo moves itself before the Prefontaine? which is what I'm hearing could happen. Mm -hmm. Why would athletes then who go to the pre all the time go to not, why do European athletes not, are they going to go to Europe mm -hmm. and then come back to the U.S.? That's going to be, again, nightmare for Nike and for mm -hmm. other sponsors. And it, they were trying to do the Diamond League, so it made some sense. I mean, there's been times when the travel, I mean, we had for years, it was Doha, Shanghai, then uh, Rome, and then Prefontaine. And you're kind of going, and I would try, I mean, I'd hit six or eight meets during the summer, 
I mm -hmm. couldn't hit Shanghai. I couldn't hit, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Rome at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and mm -hmm. I don't like missing Prefontaine because mm -hmm. it's the you know the first uh, you know Diamond League met, meet that I went to. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, I, I think it's going to continue to change day by day because we don't know what's going to yeah. happen with COVID. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's just um, the uh, so um, the Tokyo drama. Let's say a couple of nice things about Prince Philip. Um, from as an American, I saw him as a character, a truly British character. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a list I found in the Guardian of uh, ninety-nine off-color comments or rude things that the prince said, and I just mm -hmm. liked him more after reading him. Uh, yeah. He seemed like a character and a, a truly British one, and it, I think that's why people liked him. How do you comment was, on that kind of thing? There sir? was a cartoon in my newspaper which showed um, a bishop and a cabinet minister, and one of them saying, you know, I've been asked to take part in the funeral and say something inappropriate. <laughs> the, the Prince Philip, um, of course, it's interesting. I'm not sure what he would say to you if you called him, called him uh, British because he's, he's sort of half Greek, half Danish. Yeah. As well, um, but yeah, I mean, he was just a man who had this strange role. Uh, I mean, he he said that when he became the queen's husband, but not the king, he asked people, "Well, what do I do?" And he said, "Nobody knew." Yeah. So he sort of created. Uh, he created a role for himself. You know, he was often seen just walking a step behind the queen, but. Um, he was a very good sportsman, uh, yeah. several, several sports. Um, uh, he, he took an interest in conservation and wildlife issues before it was fashionable. Um, he established something called the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which millions of young people have done, which involves just, as it, often in your teenage years, challenging you to do things. Uh, you know, to go on expeditions and camp and survive without any of the mod cons, uh, or orienteering part of it, yeah. and all of that. So that's been a wonderful success, a wonderful legacy. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt actually he is one of those people that when he died, rather than all the bad things coming out, an awful lot of hidden good things about him came out. Yeah, yeah, there was one I mean, over for here. For example, when, when the Queen was walking her, uh, along a crowd of people, he would go ahead of her and look for children who had a present for her and pull them out of the crowd. Wow. So that they could actually give it to the to the Queen personally. Oh. Things like that. Yeah, the, there's a story that came up over here about him playing with John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, the day of the funeral of the of slain president, mm -hmm. and then also uh, and and how he was just relaxed playing with a three year old. Um, mm -hmm. When uh, and, and uh, a couple stories came out like that, and then I love that picture of him dressed up as uh, um, one of the royal guards with the queen laughing. Mm -hmm. I just think mm -hmm. that is just a crack up, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's he just was 99, I, so he, he had a good ending, as we say. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. I just, you know, I, I think all of us could wish to have a good long life like that and uh, have some, if you don't have moments that uh, you uh, need to apologize for in a long life, then you really haven't Absolutely. done it right. Um, in, so, in some ways, Larry, he's my role model because good. when he reached na 95, yeah. he announced his retirement. Good. Well, that's what yeah, I, I expect you at least to 95. Um, yeah. Yeah, I told uh, my girlfriend today that she knows that I'll be doing something until, you know, the day that I, I go, which I, I predict will be 98. And uh, mm. Well, no, I think so you could, you're allowed the last two years off in that case. Okay, good. All right. I like that. Um, I did have a cousin who made it to 106, so I, I thought that was kind of cool. And he wrote letters to my grandmother on rolls of toilet paper. So 
insanity <laughs> does run well in the family. Um, right. Speaking of the Zen master, Elliot Kipchoge had a nice win yesterday uh, on an Air yeah. Force or on an airport strip, running with Lufthansa planes parked behind him. Um, yeah. What did you think of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the, as Mark Twain sort of said, uh, rumors of his demise were somewhat exaggerated. You know, when he didn't win London, when everyone yeah. thought he was going to win London, uh, the questions were asked. But, you know, everyone's entitled to a bad day. He hasn't had many of them. Yeah. Uh, I still think that, I still think that anyone who finishes ahead of him in, the, in any race they're in would be far off the pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good, Stuart, very good. You know, somebody we haven't talked about and we need to give a little credit to, and this is just uh, a quick brain thing, someone we both admire is Wayne, Wayne Van Niekerk. Um, mm. He, uh, Wade was playing uh, a, um, a rugby match in 17 for uh, charity, and he yeah. injured a knee. And this was after he had won the Olympics in 16 and set a world record, won uh, the 400 and medaled in the 200 in uh, London. Um, and I've got to interview him four or five times, and I've always found him to be the most charming, understated. Uh, he's got a nice sense of humor. He is... The term I'm going to use, because I'm trying to think of a better, he is honestly religious. And what I mean by that, in the U.S., a lot of politicians use religion. And I find that there, as Mark Twain once said, and Will Rogers said even more eloquently, that it's like we're watching an intimate act. But with Wade, if you watch like the social media, he totally believes it. It's really thoughtful. And I believe it's one of his strengths. Um, yeah. Coming back from the injury that he did to now, he ran a 2010 and now a 2038 over the weekend. And he's coming to the U.S. going to be training with Lance Browman at, at Pure Athletics, mm -hmm. one of the coaches that we respect. I think one of the finest sprint coaches in the world. Yeah. And he was with a wonderful coach for all of his mm -hmm. career, um, Ms. Botha. But I believe that this was a move he needed to make. Um, any deep thoughts about Wade? It, well, um, it's a massive move, though, for him to, to leave South Africa and come yeah. to the U.S. and a uh, different, different setup. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I know him. I've spoken to him a few times. And I agree. Yeah, I think his Christian faith is, is very deep, sincere, and, uh, and, in very, and a very important part of him. I mean, he is just ridiculously talented. Doesn't yeah. he, um, if I were Stepman John, I would tell you that he's done something at under, at 100, 200, and 400. Which is yeah, like, under 10 seconds at 100, under 20 seconds at 200, under 44 seconds at 300. And I believe there are four people that have done that. But John would, uh, Stepman John, uh, would mm -hmm. definitely uh, correct us on that. Um, mm -hmm. But but he is that 43.02 that he's run, Yeah, I think that he could break it. And mm -hmm. he once said, I think he's trying to leave that legacy. Um, I think people were surprised with uh, the... the I mean, uh, doesn't, doesn't, it just, doesn't it just make you sick when... Uh, these amazingly talented athletes who are world class at their event just suddenly say, "I think I'll try a different event." Yes, and then they yeah. produce a ridiculous time at that. Yeah, well, look at Karsten Warholm in the four hundred mm -hmm. hurdles, and and then yeah. um, Shamir yeah. Little in the U.S. She just yeah. ran forty nine ninety one last week, and mm -hmm. uh, in the flat four hundred, and mm -hmm. you know. I believe that's going to help her in that 400 hurdle race, you know. Uh, and then we just yeah, saw. I, I, I was giving uh, your uh, top triple jumper, uh, Kituri Urji. Yes. Uh, Kio, 
a bit of grief uh, last week when she jumped uh, 685 in the long jump. Yeah, I sent her a message saying, not bad for part-timer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, uh, that really um, befuddles me, the whole ability for long jumpers and triple jumping, because there's such different events. But I think it's the discipline and the focus. And there are some of them who just are phenomenal at both, you know? And uh, it's kind of cool to watch. I'll tell you something that she said to me if you promise not to tell World Athletics. Sure. Um, she told me that she had taken started to take her long jump more seriously. Wow. Because she didn't think she could make a living out of the triple jump. Wow. That's a good... Well, that makes a lot of sense considering how few meets the uh, triple jump is yeah. included. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that's the kind of stuff that... Um, this one builds off some things we've been talking about, and I, I've been um, I've been thinking about this one for a while. I think the approach to the fast shoe thing is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. They're saying that the fast shoes or would make fast times. Um, I believe the fast shoes affect everybody and like going from a grass track to an artificial surface. Mm -hmm. And it's like having that with you the whole time. That's one. I do believe people are training better, but I also believe nutrition is better. But here's the biggest issue. It's belittling the value of world records. So many fast times, so many fast performances. Yeah. World records are supposed to be treasured. You know, um, breaking the mile record Coming oh so close to it five or ten times, which is what Co and Ovet would do, uh, yeah. really tantalized us. And back in the mid '80s, got us very excited. And um, seeing guys run fast 800s, you know, if someone broke um, David Rudisha's 800 every week, it'd be boring. Um, and and, and the, the three years that that Wayne Vanekirk has trained to get to the level that he can break the world record again, it, it's a great story for us. And in our sports about storytelling. So I hope World Athletics comes up with, it reminds me of back in 1976 when Nik Nikos Nemeth broke the javelin record by but over a meter on his first throw in Montreal. I have this killer picture of him doing that. And then uh, Nemeth developed a javelin. And the government had to come, or, or the IAAF had to come up and say, okay, we're going to redo the javelin because it's going too far. That's dangerous. Yeah. But it's also, it was too easy to break the records at the time. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to look at shoes more as equipment and come up with some standards. I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I know World Athletics means well, but they need to get some shoe geeks involved because mm -hmm. this stuff does affect things. And I don't like it belittling the hard work that these athletes have done. Because yeah. a big part of the reason is that athletes are in better shape when you had 18 months to train, you know? So it's yeah. just, uh, um, but any deep thoughts on the shoe stuff? There was a lovely moment in the uh, press conference that Steph Davis did after winning the British Marathon trial. Mm -hmm. And someone said to her, can you explain how you progressed from being a uh, a good club runner to go into the Olympics. And I, I sort of wrote that up for you last week. But yeah. what I didn't include was the person who asked her the question replied to her and said, um, thank goodness you didn't say it's, it's the shoes and stop there. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Um, today we heard that WADA is going to limit the number of people going to Tokyo to do yeah. anti-doping testing. And I was disappointed mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. how little testing they've done in the last 18 months. Yeah. The only thing they seem to be good at is catching people uh, three consecutive tests. Um, yeah. Now, which I think is, I, I think if you're missing three consecutive tests, I don't believe you're a cheater. I just don't believe you're kind of, you're not that considerate of what's going on in the sport. Didn't somebody say it's a bit like catching Al Capone for being late with his tax return? Yes, yes, that's very good. I mean, it just, and our, our um, 
our American friend Christian Coleman just got 18 mm -hmm. months. And yeah. uh, all I can say was I feel sorry for him, but it was sloppy. And yeah. I, I, I need to show respect to all the other athletes who do it day in and day out. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But uh, we talked about this before, and I'm with you that there really is no evidence that I'm aware of that anyone who has missed three uh, tests is actually guilty of doping. Yeah. That I'm yeah. not sure that that link, which is assumed, yeah. has actually been proved. Yeah. No, it's not. But people call them dopers and cheaters. I mean, I, it, it's yeah. it's very interesting that whole and again what i think it would be helpful to to publish um is how many times during that period was christian coleman tested because people when i first started naively i assumed when an athlete missed three tests and meant that they hadn't been tested at all yeah and of course um some athletes uh, may have had 10 tests during the year uh, and that's a good question. Bad, bad personal management uh, find themselves not in the right place uh, and miss three. Uh, that will be a question that I will ask. Okay, we're down to our final three minutes on uh, Athletics Chat 48. Um, anything that we want to close with from uh, the UK? No, I just I think. Uh, um, I think that, that what I'm hearing from athletes is that it's currently very difficult to get get competitions because yeah. um, at the moment uh, we can only leave the UK for what is deemed to be essential travel. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what exactly constitutes uh, essential. essential travel? And really, there have been very few meets at all in the UK. Yeah. So uh, I think that is what people, particularly people in the technical events, feel. Uh, yeah. I just desperately need need to get out and uh, compete. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Stuart, it's been a lovely chat. This was Athletics Chat yeah. uh, number forty-eight. Thanks again, my friend. Enjoy the pub visit. I'll be inquiring right. about that next week on Athletics Chat forty-nine. Um, this Good. is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. Um, would you like to make a final comment, Stuart? No, I'm just looking forward to the pub, as you say. Okay. All right. Enjoy the pub. Larry Eater with Run Blog Run and Stuart Weir, Athletics Chat 48. If you like Run Blog Run, please like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you love us, subscribe on the YouTube channel, and you can see all 48 of the Athletics oh. Chats. Isn't that exciting? All 48. All isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? Mm -hmm. I think that's worth a few pints of Guinness, my dear friend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You have a wonderful Good. week, Stuart. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank you. Hey, sports fans. This is the epilogue for Athletics Chat number 48. And it's April 19, 2021. And um, we're in San Jose, California. We were chatting with Stuart Weir, who's in Oxford, England, the intellectual capital of the world. And today we covered a variety of subjects. We first started about uh, talking about the Diamond League. Uh, it was supposed to start in Rabat, Morocco, but Rabat doesn't want to hold it. So they moved it to Gateshead, England. Gateshead is a lovely uh, place to have a track meet, great history of track and field. And uh, hope, excuse me, Hope to attend. We'll have to see with my vaccine uh, card if they'll let me go or not. But uh, it means that it's starting. So that would be May 23rd. May 28th would be lovely um, uh, Doha, Qatar. And then I believe the next meet uh, is in Florence, where the it's going to be called the Rome Diamond League meeting. And then they take a little break after the U.S. and British trials and come back in early July. Uh, but it's nice to see the Diamond League uh, happening. Oslo has been moved. Uh, that's going to happen sometime later in the season. And we hear some conflicts with that with Pre. We hope that doesn't happen because of Pre is a glorious meet. And Oslo is a lot of fun, too. And we want to see them both happen. And both get the crowd support that they deserve. Uh, crowds. Wow, what does that mean? 
Um, in British soccer news, uh, British football news, uh, they've had 4,000 people in stadium. They said the next thing they're going to do is 10,000, and maybe they'll see 20,000 down the road. But if we could see a few thousand in Gateshead, that would be pretty awesome. So we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. Um, the U.S. and the U.K. continue to have progress, but there's also some scary things. So please wear your mask. Please get vaccines. If you're not going to get vaccines, stay the hell away from everybody else. Um, and even after you've got a vaccine, be careful. Hydrate, exercise, wear a mask when you can't be 6 to 12 feet away, when you can't be around everybody else who's been vaccinated too. Just be careful, okay? This is, I know this is like nothing else we've seen in our lives. And I feel really bad for the young kids too. And, uh, you know, the older folks like me, I'm kind of frustrated with it too. I'm in the backyard watching hummingbirds and squirrels and lizards and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of fun. Uh, other topics on uh, week uh, 48. So Elliot Kipchoge, 204.50 in uh, and on Shada. And what I didn't say about that before is it's a pretty incredible event because here's the deal. It was supposed to be in, um, I believe, Hanover. It was supposed to be in Germany. And it had to be moved to the Netherlands because of the pandemic. And so the people of the Unshot Marathon in the Netherlands, a very famous marathon where Gerard Niebuhr ran pretty quick and where um, uh, several other fine marathoners have, uh, have done well. Um, they did a actually a confined course on an airstrip in Unshot. And uh, uh, Elliot took off and he looked amazing. Uh, we also had some great uh, performances at the Tom Brown Invite and some performances all over the U.S., which were pretty exciting. Uh, saw Cindy McLaughlin on uh, a full track video. Uh, she got her PB at the 100-meter hurdles and ran a pretty impressive 400 as well. And, uh, and then also saw Candace Hill run her best time since 2016. That was pretty exciting as well. And uh, we really like Candace. She's fun to interview. And it's great to see an athlete uh, emerge uh, once again from uh, uh, a pack of really good athletes to really putting something together. So uh, it's been a pretty good week. The, the, Tokyo, Mar the Tokyo Olympics is still confusing. Uh, what do we know now? Well, uh, the secretary of the LDP, the majority party in uh, Japanese politics, said that the Olympics could possibly be closed. Then he said he had confidence in the local governing party, obviously, our local organizing committee, obviously uh, a, a something to save a little bit of face. And the prime minister said, of course, we're going to do the Olympics. Well, now the head of the IC is going over to see part of the Olympic uh, torch event as um, various prefectures in Tokyo are under various states of lockdown. People going into Japan, Japanese nationals are having a rough time in quarantine. What do you think? Uh, media folks are going to have going over there if anybody's sick on an airplane. I just think this is so ill-advised for so many reasons. I love the Olympics. I want the Olympics to, to happen. I want there to be an Olympics in Japan. I don't know if it's the right year. I really don't know. Should we be waiting till 2024 for all this stuff? It will be a Petri dish in lovely Tokyo. Uh, with all the athletes in close quarters, all the officials, everybody else, there will be sick people there, and it could be a mess. Um, and I wish the IOC, and I know they've got to think about other things, but the IOC and the USOC, this is could damage the legacy of the Olympics. And they've just got to think about those things. And it's terribly difficult, but uh, it changes every day. You just don't know what's going on. U.S. Olympic trials. I'm filling out the applications for media today. Uh, I suspect we'll have 15 to 20 percent uh, fans in the stadium. Uh, we might have more. Uh, keep our fingers crossed, but uh, we should know more over the next few weeks. But it's middle of April. A lot of things can happen between April and the beginning of June. So let's keep our fingers crossed, wear a mask, um, get your vaccine. Um, many millions have taken it. They're not dropping dead. There's no computer chip in it. It's not the world government taking over um, or any of the other kind of strange stuff. And I understand being concerned 
And I respect, suspect people going, well, it's not really tested. The problem is this is killing a lot of people and it could kill a lot more. And to the best of our knowledge, we know that these things are working right now. Nothing's going to be perfect and people expect perfection. And Mother Nature reminds us there is no perfection, okay, except her. So that's my apostle for the week. Lots of great things to enjoy on Athletics Chat 48. Thanks to Mike Deering for getting all this thing done, you know, recording it, dealing with uh, Stuart and I, laughing at my jokes, um, developing the video, getting it posted. It's a lot of work, and he's, he's got to put up with me every day. So, you know, just give him a little round of applause. But if you like Run Blog Run, uh, like us on Instagram, Twitter, and Instagram. If you love us, subscribe on YouTube. 2,500 videos and audios over the last 11 years, 369 last year alone. And we got some fun things coming up this year, so stay tuned. Something for everyone who likes global athletics. Um, today is also the 10th anniversary of the death of Greta Waits, and uh, just take a moment and consider the nine-time New York City Marathon winner, the world cross-country champion. Um, you are the world champion at the marathon. She was an incredible athlete, an incredible legacy. Um, her foundation um, is still showing that fitness and health can help people with cancer and help them fight it. So take a moment and think about her. Check, Google her, learn a little bit about one of the real champions of our sport. Okay, Larry Eater signing off. Talk to you soon.